All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the main Masonic College course on talents. Uh, you're here, but are your talents? This is Talent 101. It's a prerequisite to a later course in January. That will be advanced talents based on Clifton Strength. And before we get too far into it here, I have the preamble in case you're a new to our courses. My name is George McDougall. I'm a, a regent for the board of the Maine Masonic College. We have a couple more board members here with Don and Brian and Walter. So feel free to ask any questions about the board and the Maine Masonic College, you know, after the class, we'll be glad to help you out. But uh, since its founding in 2005, the Maine Masonic College has worked on developing qualified faculty to share their personal expertise and their dedication to learning. It is the college's goal to offer two classes per month free of charge with the majority of those classes open to the public. In addition, there are two semi-annual events, the celebration of the arts and sciences and the college convocation, each which feature prominent guest speakers who are leaders in their fields. And as many of you know, of course, we just had the convocation and not only was it leaders from the United States as it usually is, it was leaders all over the world. The college has developed strong educational partnerships outside the craft with the University of Maine Honors Program, as well as the University of Maine Planetarium. We take part in National History Day and provide financial support and volunteer hours to youth betterment initiatives to strengthen children's love of learning. As Masons, we know from our ritual about the importance of studying the seven liberal arts and sciences. These traditionally were grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But in the modern world, they have come to encompass the humanities, social sciences, and performing and fine arts as well. It is from this broad foundation that the Masonic College creates our programs. While our uh, classes may sometimes make reference to lessons Masons have learned in the craft, it is also our goal to academically engage with the general public to create programs which enrich and stimulate. As the college model states, we seek to bring more light to everyone we meet. I wanna thank you for attending this Maine Masonic College course. I'll just say that the, uh, the way we're gonna do it is if you have questions, put them into the chat and I will let uh, the instructor know that they're there because he's not gonna be able to follow it, especially if he's sharing his screen. And today we're talking about Talent 101. In this highly interactive class, participants will be introduced to the rich resource and diversity of talents within themselves and within those around them. They will learn that it is through the application of these talents individually and as teams that we ultimately create accomplishments. So we'll start with a brief discussion on societal myths and misconceptions of talent. Then we're going to be introduced to a language that will allow for greater awareness around and leveraging our talents to create successful outcomes. The instructor today is uh, my brother, Malcolm McDougall. And Malcolm was an organizational performance consultant, former director of global planning for Haynes Brands, a graduate of Harvard University and Gallup certified strengths coach. Malcolm combines 34 years of supply chain and corporate experience with an in-depth understanding of world-class employee engagement and development tools to design and deploy sustainable team-based solutions that enhance team member well-being while driving organizational outcomes. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Malcolm to lead the class. Thank you for being with us, Malcolm. George, thank you so much. And just to be clear, that's my biological brother. Yes, I'm going to mute everyone, Malcolm, so you probably have to well, unmute yourself. Uh, okay, so I always love to start the, this, uh, this session out and most sessions out with a Maya Angelou quote, being from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, we always like to quote Angelo. She lived here and was at Wake Forest University. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will even forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think, you know, Brian was making some great 
comments and discussion when we first started about people coming together that are diverse and have different ways of thinking about things. And I think if we just keep this, this thought in mind that our discussions will be really productive today. In his, in his book, Start With Why, Simon Sinek introduces us to his construct of the golden circles. The golden circles explain how people and organizations effectively communi communicate and are illustrated by three golden rings. The inner ring explains why we do something. The middle ring explains how we do it. And the final outer ring explains what we actually do. I feel like I'm borrowing pretty heavily here from Don and George McDougall's class on critical thinking, but our brain actually does play a big role in how we think about why, how, and what. The, the what and the how are actually located in the neocortex portion of our brain. And in this portion of our brain also lie analytical and logical thought and the control of speech. Thus, it makes it fairly easy for someone to ask us what we do and for us to usually very quickly explain what it is we do. However, for the why, the why is more emotional. It lies in the limbic portion, the limbic system of the brain and makes it much more difficult for us to explain to people the real core why we do something. And yet it's so critical to explain why to people if you want them to be engaged. 70% of our decisions are actually made emotionally. And you may, if you think about it, how many times have you said to someone, well, I think that's, I think that feels like the right decision. So th that limbic system, that why we do things all ties into the emotions. Most of us struggle to explain that, but inspirational leaders always start with why. If you look at business, you have to look no further than Walmart and Apple. When each of these companies lost their inspirational leader, they really lost their way, whether it was Sam Walton or Steve Jobs. Those two leaders understood the why of their organization. They were the North Star and continually brought everybody back to that purpose. Walter McDougall is an inspirational leader. McDougall has spent the better part of his time since serving as Grand Master explaining the why of Freemasonry. You just have to look at his book, Freemasonry, the vital exploration. Now I'm speaking as though I don't personally know the author. So full disclosure, I have a brother on the call uh, on, in the session today and Walter McDougall is my father. So I've seen right from the very beginning of, of my life that starting with why is important. So I'm going to try to start with why we need to think about talent. So when people have the opportunity to use their greatest talents and strengths, and I'm going to use those two words somewhat interchangeably, when they have the chance, the opportunity to use their greatest talents or strengths, they experience more positive energy, are more likely to achieve their goals, are more confident, perform better at work, are more creative and experience less stress. People who focus on using their talents, on using their strengths, are six times more likely to be engaged in their jobs, in their organizations. So what would it be like for a Masonic Lodge 
if people if their members were six times more engaged if it wasn't the fact that 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work if more people were like child charles looking to get involved that would be an amazing increase of capacity and capability for the Masons to achieve their why. The people who use their strengths and talents are also three times more likely to report having an excellent quality of life. So when we talk about talents, these are the reasons why we want to get people leaning into their talents. But again, I'm trying to explain something that's more emotional by using words. So let me switch that and give you a picture of what I'm trying to accomplish as a strength coach. I'm trying to put a person up on the mountaintop, succeeding at everything they do, changing their life and changing the life of those around them. That's what it means to me to help people understand their talents and their strengths. So as George said, welcome to Talent 101. You're showing up, but are your talents? Let me see if I can get our video up here, George. All right, now. Yeah, I hope so. This is a good one. Yeah, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to reshare because I want to get the share sound up. And then I'm going to get it. I think I've got it this time, George. Let's see if you can see the Geico commercial. George, do you see the screen that's showing Geico commercial? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Good. All right, so we're going to let Pinocchio help us out. This is a commercial by Geico that said, did you know Pinocchio was a bad motivational speaker? Let's listen to this. This could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Everybody knows that. Well, did you know Pinocchio was a bad motivational speaker? I look around this room and I see nothing but untapped potential. You have potential. You have, oh boy. All right. Um, so, so let's, let's talk. So we're going to talk for a minute here. So remember, if you want to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself. So what, what makes that commercial so funny? Did everybody first, did, every, did a lot of people find it humorous? Yeah, it was unexpected. <laughs> unexpected, Charles, unexpected. Eric was shaking his head, humorous, got it, good. So Geico spends millions of dollars advertising every year. Their commercials, they tend to try to be funny with them, try to be humorous. What, 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 what makes this commercial humorous? What makes it funny? Well, you know, it's funny. I didn't think of this before, but it's almost like an, you have to have an implied knowledge that they're banking it's... their whole system on here. Exactly. Yep. And that's why I didn't find it humorous. I okay. was thrown off. I, it was out of place. It took me a few seconds to get it right in my head. Then I was a, then I could see where they were going. But by that time it was over. Okay, great, Charles. You could see where it was going, but it, it took a little bit of time to get there. Got it. Other other comments. So hey, you know said dumb. I was saying, you notice the gentleman that he's talking to is all by himself too when he's going like you have potential. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I never noticed that before until this time. So, 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 what's interesting about using Pinocchio as a motivational speaker? Well, one of the facts is that when Pinocchio says a lie, a very obvious lie, it becomes very obvious to everyone. And I think Perfect. a lot of perceptions are that, you know, when you're talking about a motivational speaker and someone says to you, you know, you have potential, you have potential, 
a lot of folks wonder, are they really being honest? And here's a case where the, the honesty was, was, was shown to be really false. Excellent. So Eric, you, you have hit on the two elements of humor that are required to make something like this funny. There, there has to be a Pinocchio whose nose, we know that his nose grows when he tells lies. Pinocchio is not a born liar. He, you know, he's not a psychopathic liar, so, right? But if he does lie, his nose will grow. And those of us watching the com commercial eventually realize, oh yeah, this isn't going to go well for Pinocchio. He, motivational speakers are always having to lie to people. So what's interesting is in our culture, it, most people, as they watch that commercial, very quickly understand that Pinocchio's nose will be growing by the end of the commercial. Because we all naturally believe that talent and potential is rare. Our culture reinforces that these things are rare. So what I want to do is tell you some good news. It's not rare. You know, we celebrate the rock star. We celebrate the movie star. We celebrate the sports star. Basically, if you have star in your title, we celebrate you. You have talent. It's taken us a pandemic to start to celebrate the essential worker, the person who gets accomplishments done every single day. So I wanna give you the good news that talent is actually ubiquitous to the human experience. Now, for those of you who are fans of the movie, The Princess Bride, you may say, Malcolm, I don't think that word means exactly what you think it means, but I can assure you, ubiquitous does mean what I think. It means found everywhere. So talent, is found everywhere. It's abundant. It's very common. Talent is inescapable. And I think this next quote by Zig Ziglar really gets to the right point. You were designed for accomplishment, engineered for success, and endowed with the seeds of greatness. Ziglar is telling us you were born with talent. And he's right. You were born with talent and you gained talent very early in life. There's both a nature and a nurture aspect to talent. But talent is acquired very early in life, not so much later in life. So the first truth that I want to make sure you're aware of is talent is inescapable. We all have it bunches of it. So let me let me be clear what I mean by talent. I'm going to, as George mentioned, we're going to touch on Clifton Strengths. Clifton Strengths is a talent assessment and leveraging training tool that is prepared by Gallup. Talent, the definition we use is talent is a naturally recurring pattern of thought, feeling or behavior that can be productively applied. So some of the key words I want to focus on in that definition is talent for you, your talents are natural for you. And as such, you might not even think it's talent. It's just the way you are. And you might even think it's the way everybody should be. They're recurring. Your talents can be used over and over and over again to accomplish outcomes. And there can be productively used. Talents are productive. It's how we accomplish all outcomes. Ways that you can see when you're working in areas of talent for yourself would be areas where you rapidly learn. I really am good at learning in this area. 
or areas where you have a yearning to get back to doing that type of work, whether it's professional work or volunteer work or, or other personal work. You may find yourself in a flow. In other words, you're working on something and you lose track of time. And you look up and it's seven o'clock in the evening and you haven't left work yet. Well, you may be in flow. You may be doing what you do best. Glimpses of excellence. When someone tells you, hey, that was really great, George, what you did right there. That might be an example that you're working in an area of talent for you. And finally, satisfaction. If you complete a task, complete something and feel very satisfied, that's probably a good clue that you're working in your area of natural talent. So I, I really want to uh, be careful and, and separate out talent from other things that we are very aware of, such as experience, skill, and knowledge, and also a thing I like to call gifts. So let's talk about um, these in the, as to can they be acquired, can they become obsolete, and are they highly flexible? So let's talk about things that we really talk about every day. We put them on our resume, right? Our experience, our skill, and our education and knowledge. Can these things be acquired? Well, yes, they can. I think we all agree that we acquire experiences as we go through them. We acquire skills as we, as we learn how to perform a new task. And certainly we can acquire education and knowledge. And I applaud you all for being on here this morning. I, I feel some pressure to make sure that I give you some uh, ability to um, learn something new. And let me see, sorry, I've lost my screen here. Let me get that back up. There we go. All right. So, but, the, but what's interesting, when I work with people who are looking for a new job, they're either unemployed or looking for a new job, um, they they always are very concerned about their experience, their skills and their knowledge because these things can become obsolete. If you don't keep your skills up to date, then they can become obsolete. Jo My brother George tells a great story about this. He talks about being a surveyor. He's an engineer by trade, a civil engineer. And at one point when he came out of college, he knew how to do surveying. He knew how to use the equipment of that time. But now, some number of years later, the equipment has changed dramatically to include lasers and such. So it would be difficult for him to be a surveyor now. Um, so that's an example of experience, skill, and knowledge that became obsolete. These, these things can also be flexible or not flexible. If you're switching careers, and you're moving from a company that uses one type of software and going to a company that uses a different type of accounting software, let's say, then your skill and knowledge and experience may not be very helpful. It may have become obsolete and not be flexible in that move. So, so that these things, we think about them all the time and it's important, they can be acquired, they can become obsolete, and they may or may not be flexible. Another thing that I want, another area that I want to talk about is gifts. A gift is what we see when we see a 220 pound linebacker running the 40 yard dash in 4.4 seconds on Sunday or Saturday afternoon. That's a gift. Not everybody's born with the ability to run like that. Not everybody's born with the ability to sing in perfect pitch. What's interesting is we don't see everybody who is born with those gifts on TV, on Saturday afternoon, or, or in the opera, because they may not have had the talents required, such as focus, 
and discipline to bring those gifts to fruition. Which brings us to our last category, talent. So, so talent is generally not, it cannot be acquired after your formative years. It, but the good news is it won't become obsolete. The ability to communicate well is a talent. That will not become obsolete and that is usually highly flexible. You can take it with you and utilize it wherever you go. So, so as we talk more about talents, I want you to keep in mind these ways of thinking about uh, experiences, skills, and knowledge versus talent versus gifts. So I wanna give you guys an example here. So go ahead and use the chat box to give out answers. And George, I'm gonna check in with you, George. Are you able to see the chat, brother? Yes, I have it up right here, yeah. All right, perfect. So we're gonna be looking for you guys to type in some answers, that would be great. So I've got a little picture here, a little puzzle, little word puzzle. Can anybody tell me what the phrase is that this word puzzle represents? What is the phrase? And George, I'll let you holler out to me if you start to see anybody responding on the chat. Eric nailed it right there. Derek's got it as well. Okay, couple quick, good, couple Most quick Dennis answers. Too. Yeah. Yep. Dennis is close. Yep. But Charles was close. Yeah. All right. That's what I was. Ah, I see it now. Yeah, I could see it. All right. There we good, go. Good. Good. So we've got, we had some people come in very quickly with answers that are one in a million, one in a million. Well, how, how did you get that? Well, the, the people that got it very quickly saw that the one was a number in the middle of a word, it was out of place. And very quickly their minds just said, well, this looks like it could be one in a million. So excellent. So. I'm gonna show you another one and, and see how quickly you can get this. Does anybody see, I see, I see the chat and I can see the chat number went from five to six. So I think someone just stuck something in chat. Eric got something, I can't remember exactly what it is myself okay. on this one, but I think he got okay. it. All right. So Eric was in quick again. Oh, yeah, he almost got it. He very, very okay. close. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people, yeah. Good. All right, so this one, anybody wanna holler it out to us? Actually, I don't think anyone got it quite yet. Okay. So when you look at this, if you follow the same rule, what letter is out of place? A. Yeah. So this one is a raise in pay, a raise in pay, or some people come back with a, a pay raise. Yes. And that's what we were getting. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. Let's try it. Let's try a third one. Let me give you this word puzzle. Does anybody see the phrase that comes out of this word picture? Yeah, Eric's not gonna be fooled again. So he's got he's pretty much got that one pretty close. Okay. There we go, right there. Derek's got it and Brian's got it right on the money. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. So this fall one from is grace. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. A fall from grace. A fall from grace. All right. I'm going to give you one more and let's see how you do with this. Now, if you get this, feel free to type it right in chat. Or here, I'm going to give a couple more seconds. If you get it, go ahead and holler it out to us. Well, on second thought. Don got it on, but I think that was Don, but on second thought. Correct. 
Now, this one was different. It didn't follow the same rule, right? It wasn't a simple letter out of place. So as we go through, as we went through the first three, one in a million, a raise in pay, a fall from grace, people generally start to get more and more, more and more people generally start to get them as we go down because I'm teaching you a rule. Look for the letter or number that's out of place, the character that's out of place, and just try to say it out loud. But this one was different. This one was word placement, but on second thought. So if you were, get, if you were initially getting better at those first three puzzles, this puzzle may not have been very easy for you because I didn't teach you how to, I didn't give you a talent for solving word puzzles. I had really given you a rule, a skill for solving very specific word puzzles. And when I changed the puzzle, that rule no longer helps you. So that's what it's really like to help teach people skills versus trying to get them to lean into their talents. Any, any thoughts or comments on that? Oh, I'm gonna unmute it. I'm too busy trying to understand the message. <laughs> okay, all right. We'll get, you know, we're getting, we're getting... I've, ne I've never been good with word puzzles. I've always avoided them throughout my life. So, so I got a question. If we go back to the Pinocchio. Yes. Is it just because the it's implied that we know who Pinocchio is and that's why it is funny? James, great question and great comment. Number one, if a culture, if a group of people don't know who Pinocchio is, that will not be a funny video. You have to know who Pinocchio is and you have to know that if he tells a lie, his nose will grow. That is culturally, that is required to make that video funny. The second thing that's required to make it funny is you have to believe as Eric called out that a lot of times we think motivational speakers are just telling us what we want to hear that they're really lying. So it takes really both of those elements to create the humor. A great call out. So we're right. gonna answer that phone. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I missed maybe. that one. Come from the culture, but I I hadn't seen Pinocchio in centuries almost. So it Correct. was just out of place. Ex and exactly. the last thing on my mind is motivational speakers lie. Well, yep. actually, I've never really paid attention to any motivational speakers, so yep. I didn't know so that you, fact. Yeah, so you, you have to, so culturally, Geico knows that the majority of people know who Pinocchio is and that the majority of people believe that people don't have potential and motivational speakers are liars and a waste of time. So, yeah, yeah that the, great, great call the, out, James. You know, the other thing that I, that I noticed so, in having Pinocchio is that actually the more you know about Pinocchio, the funnier it is. Because yeah. of the real the real story of Pinocchio, he was a really sociopathic character who did all kinds of really horrible things. And so he did a lot of lying, but he also did stealing and cheating and everything. And having him as a Pinoc as a sort of motivational speaker, just just that sort of it's almost one of those circumstances where the more you know, the funnier it becomes. Yep. James, did you have another comment? So in essence, or well, I just, the, the fact that if you watch Saturday Night, Night Live, you know where the motivational speaker lives. He lives in a van down by the river. <laughs> so, <Hey. laughs> so, but you, what you're saying is they, they both have to have a common point of reference where it doesn't work. Yeah, correct. You, yes, you do have to. So you definitely have to have two, two common conceptions for that to be funny. The conception that Pinocchio's nose will grow when he lies 
and that he is going to be put in a position of needing to lie as a motivational speaker. Yeah. People have yep, to have great. expectations for you to subvert their expectations. Yep. Yep. You can say that with masonry too. If you don't understand any of the, like the lingo with masonry, you'll never get any of the humor jokes. I see them all the time on Facebook and yeah. If you don't so know Brian, the song, that's, you can... Yeah, Brian, that's a great call out. And uh, so as we get a little bit deeper into the workshop this morning, you guys, are, as, as I think you've been in the workshop maybe once before, you're gonna have a chance to have some discussions and you can bring up some great points like that, that you know people may not know things about masonry or, or if they don't have a, a common understanding, that can be a very big disadvantage. Yeah, great, all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep pushing us forward here. Great comments, guys. And I'm probably gonna pick up at the wrong point, but that's okay, we'll zip right on through it. Yep, all right. There we go. So that brings us to our second, the second truth I want you guys to know about talent. Talent is really timeless. It, it doesn't become obsolete and it is highly flexible. You can use your talents as building blocks to accomplish many different tasks. So we, we are gonna give you just a little bit of a spoiler alert and talk about Clifton Strengths for a second to give us a little language here. So Talent is broken into four categories or four domains. Strategic thinking, how a person absorbs and analyzes information that informs better decisions. Relationship building, how a person builds strong relationships and interacts with others, how they work as part of a team. Influencing talents, how a person influences others, takes charge, speaks up, and makes sure others are heard. And finally, execution talents, how a person makes things happen, how they get their energy and focus to accomplish something. So, so I'm going to stop again. We're going to do a little discussion here. And I want you guys to think about an accomplishment that you've had in the last 12 to 24 months, let's say the last one or two years, or, or so, have you had an accomplishment, one big enough to require working with other people that you are willing to tell us about? And what, and what, as you tell us about it, I think what we will see is that to make that accomplishment happen, you had to do some strategic thinking. You had to collect some information. You had to create a plan. You had to think about it. Then you had to pull other people in, either by influencing them or building relationships with them. And then as a team, you executed a project. So think about an accomplishment that you've had, and I'm going to unshare and bring us back together. And I am looking for one or two people who feel comfortable sharing an accomplishment that they've had in the last, say, one or two years, maybe, um, and that maybe required them to work with some other people to actually get the accomplishment done. Charles? Actually, I'm going to do the opposite. You caused me to realize what's been holding me back. Okay. The first element, no problem, but the rest has been lacking. And I've been okay. actually trying that, uh, trying to find somebody to get started with all the other things to kind of help get the other things rolling. So I sit back and I tend to wait for other people to do what I've dreamed of doing. And then I, I just it. become supportive. supportive. So, so Charles, what that, what that sort of indicates to me is that you probably have a fair number of strategic thinking talent that you may think about many different options for doing something, think about the future, this is where we could go in the future. Um, and this is an area of strength, of talent for you. But what you find 
The challenge is you may not have as many talents for pulling the team together, for influencing that Zero team. Zero talent. <laughs> yep. So great. So great. All right. Good. Good call out. Other comments. Other. Does anyone have an accomplishment, or does anyone want to make some comments, Victor? Yes. Um, I've been a songwriter and a poet for quite a few years in my life, and. Um, accumulate a lot of information and I wanted to put together a CD of my own music and it took me a while but with the internet and not being afraid to take chances I found myself a producer who was out of Nashville uh, on the internet and over the winter of uh, 2016 and 2017 working he was in california at the time so i was working on california time late at night i managed to put together a six uh, 13 song cd of my own original music now, i wanted to do that my whole life but um i knew that this computer thing this internet thing was was just awesome the more i i worked with it and i took a chance and I found a guy and I got it done. And it took me nine months, 10 months that year to get it done. The point was I got it done in that short of time. Fellow musicians that I know from New York City and stuff told me about their experiences with their doing the same or similar thing. It took them years to do. So to me, it was not only an accomplishment for myself, I saved a lot of money by doing it that way. And uh, I got to share that music with my family and my friends and my community, et cetera. So. Victor, thank you. That, that is a great example of where you had to move through all four domains. You had to start out, create a plan. How am I going to do this? You did research. Then you recruited people that had talent that you needed got them working on your team. And then as a team, you executed creating that CD. So that's a, that's a great example. And the other people, the other musicians who are struggling with that are, ha are having a difficult time somewhere moving through those four domains. So great, thank you for sharing that example. Do we have, a, do we have another example? Or, or more comments. I really appreciated Charles's comments too. Yes, Eric. Because I had the exact same issues that uh, that Charles has in terms of being sort of strategic, but really being reticent about involving other people. But you know, at one time, a lot you know, a lot of folks know I was actually in um, fairly recently was an end stage renal disease. And I had major, major medical issues. I was in uh, Mass General Hospital. Um, and someone said, well, did you ever send out a message asking people, you know, is there anyone who can donate a kidney? And I said, I really don't reach out. I, you know, sort of just keep things sort of in. And I said, look, give it a try. And I actually went on Facebook, which I never do for that, and sort of sent out a plea saying, listen, here's, here's my situation. Are there folks that can help? And actually, I got a, I got an incredible number of responses, really from all over the country. And as it turns out, there was a person who actually worked with me in my office who said, "Yeah, I think I might be a match." And so, basically, recruited her. And you know, we we contacted different people, we set up the appointments, and as it turns out, she was a perfect match. And I was actually able to get the um, the kidney transplant. If she was not available, it would have been another several years. I still would be uh, sort of an end stage, you know, failure having dialysis almost daily. So that was one where the accomplishment, sort of the the disability, actually kind of forced me into the other, you know, the other themes. Uh, but aside from from that, uh, Charles, I I really I I hear you, and I absolutely share those those lacks of uh, of talents that you described. So Eric, what, thank thank you for sharing that story. Um, and what it what it shows is we can 
we all find a way when necessary to push through the four domains. But most of us feel comfortable working in one or two of those domains. And because of that, it's why as a team, as team members, we can accomplish so much more because what, what we're strong in, someone else may not be, but they may have the talent that we need to pair with. So partnering and being part of a team allows us to accomplish a great deal more and allows us to work in areas where we get more energy and have more confidence to do because we're working in our area of talent. So guys, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm gonna keep us, I'm gonna keep moving, but that those were great examples. Thank you. So this is a t-shirt that my dad received for his birthday many years ago um, from his sisters who loved him and wanted to share this sense of humor with him. My dad is not dyslexic, but he is an atrocious speller. And he could not, he can't spell the word atrocious, I can assure you, without spell check. This was, an this was actually an embarrassment for him throughout most of his life. Um, but despite this weakness, he managed to author hundreds of articles and at last count has authored eight books. It turns out that there are people called editors who are good with grammar and spelling. So keep partnerships in mind to overcome weaknesses, right? So in his 80s, he published his final book, or actually it's not, he's come back with another book now. So thank you, dad, you're messing up my presentation. His second to last book called Angel of Baton. The book is a sweeping biography of Alice Zwicker, a World War II army nurse who was among the first group of American service women ever captured by the enemy during wartime. Alice's family knew my dad and they trusted him to tell her story. The book opens with the following scene. Alice is sitting in a dimly lit underground concrete bunker on the island of Corregidor. Dust is falling from the ceiling as the Japanese bombed this last American position in the Philippines. Alice is holding a glass of dirty water, her rations for the day. Her mind drifts to her childhood and she sees the spring on her family's farm, which provided unlimited, cool, clean water. Alice would go on to endure the now infamous Bataan Death March and three long years of captivity. She would survive and return home to a hero's welcome but like so many, she would never truly escape the horror the war had inflicted on her soul. My dad asked me, son, who do you think will be interested in reading this book? I looked at him and I said, dad, everybody will wanna read this book. My dad can't spell, but he can write. And if he, had if he had allowed his lack of spelling skill talent to keep him from his writing talent, we would have never gotten this book. So I want, I want everyone to understand, and this is the way it works, has worked for 34 years in my business life. We always focus on correcting weaknesses. Correcting your weakness will help you become okay at something, help you become operational at best, but building on your talent will help you become great at something. It's much easier, much less energy to go from good to great than it is to go from not good to mediocre. So I hope each of you will join me 
in focusing on the choice of going from good, what we're already good at, to being great at it. So the third lesson about talent is you need to build on your talents to achieve great outcomes. The management philosopher, Peter Drucker, tried to drive this point home to, to his students. Build on your talent. Start with what you're already good at and become excellent at it. We're, we're gonna take, uh, I'm gonna stop to share. We got a little break here. All right, perfect. We're gonna take uh, 10 minutes, George, to allow people to refresh their coffee, recycle their coffee, or sit around and chat. But okay. I think we're at about 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So we'll start again at 1010. Sounds great. That's I just good. have a few announcements to make before people leave the screen. Our, uh, our first in-person class in probably close to two years is going to be December 4th, and it's going to be at the Planetarium at the University of Maine up in Orono. So we're pretty excited to get that started. It's kind of keying on the phrase in the second degree lecture that numerous worlds are around us, and it's going to be on the Galileo Project. And if you haven't heard of that, that's where they're actually looking for other planets that could sustain life out in the solar system, out in the uh, galaxy, other solar systems that have planets that might sustain life. So it's pretty exciting. Um, look for the talent, too, uh, on our website. It's going to take place in January. And a quick question for you, Malcolm, because I know we need to take our Clifton Strengths test. Does it matter which one we take? because there's a number of those. Correct. There's one, there's one assessment, but you can get the assessment by purchasing a number of books. And I, I will talk about that at the end, George, but I, okay. I, I can mention it here. Our, our class Talent 201 requires that you have taken Clifton Strengths, that you have shared your results with me, because I will be providing you some material for you personally to use in that class. And a final announcement before we go to the break is February is another possible in-person class. We're not quite sure yet, but it's gonna be on the uh, Abenaki Nation and their, I believe on their the speech they developed, but it's with the uh, University of Maine History Chair, Liam Riordan. So again, look on the website for more on that course, but there's another one that we're pretty excited to get started as well. So, all right, ten, see you all right, 10, 10. Very good. You know, I have sure. to admit that deep inside, I haven't really grasped completely your definition of talent. Great. So, um, so let's let's talk through that a little bit. So it's it's a it's a naturally recurring way of thinking, feeling, or doing something. Mm -hmm. So what what occurs, Charles? Your brain forms patterns inside it yes. of how you think about things, how you feel about things, or how you like to take action, how you like to execute things. Okay. Um, and once and once those patterns are formed, they become like super highways. And the and the other talents that you have less of are like back roads. So it, for you, the way you were describing how you would try to move through a project, it, it indicates to me that you are very good about thinking about things. You might be very yeah, good that at that. I do a lot. Right? Thinking a whole lot, generating a lot of ideas, thinking about a lot of options, maybe thinking about the future. What could the future look like? So those are very strong ways of thinking about things. Okay. Um, now, you may have less talent in the area of relationship building. Maybe you don't really like to hang around with a lot of people. 
and we're, and we're going to talk a little bit. Of, we're going to have a great discussion on okay. how we network and stuff. But that may be an area of lesser talent for you. You could do it, but it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be an area of high energy for you. And you might just, you'd be better off finding a partner to work with on a project that is good at recruiting people and developing that team. Okay, let me see if I'm getting you. All right, so, so far you've isolated it to pretty much the way you think. And then your ability to network with others. Am I correct? Yes. Your ability to think through problems, to gather data, to create ideas. Right. Then your ability to interact with other people, to okay. influence them, to build teams, to interact. Okay, so with it's them. about the influencing and the team building. I think team the building. issue that I'm having is I really don't know my talents. So yeah. that's probably why I'm I'm probing and struggling with this. I yeah, wonder if some examples, Malcolm, would help. Yeah, and so we're gonna, and so when we st we're gonna start right back up here, up here in about one minute, okay. and we're yeah, gonna yeah. actually jump into some good examples. Great. No, Charles, talking about talent is very difficult unless we all share the same language created by Clifton Strengths. So I'm going to share a little bit about Clifton Strengths during this second half of the workshop. And Can someone in, type the spelling of his name in the chat. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I can do that right now. I'm okay, because right then I'll look for some material on him. Don Clifton Gallup Incorporated. Yeah. I'm like your father. I can't spell. So <laughs> I can't even see when people say words, how to spell it. Yep. So there I put, I put into the chat, Gallup Incorporated is the company that owns Clifton Strengths. If you type Clifton Strengths into the internet, you should be taken to a chance to choose a Gallup website. And from there, you can actually watch several videos on it, several four minute videos. Um, and as George mentioned, I will be talking about how you can actually take the assessment by simply purchasing a book for $20 or so and using the free coupon in the back of the book to take the assessment. Okay. And uh, be, be, yeah, it'd be very exciting for people to do that and then take that second class with us. All right. Now I just found out the, the surprising way that actually it did save the chat from the last meeting. I just didn't, I looked in, I'm not used to working with this Zoom. Oh, shucks. Now I can't find it again. I have to go back to the beginning. <laughs> I thought it was saving everything in a single folder and, and I kept opening up that one folder seeing the same name, the same date is the first chat I ever saved. And what I didn't realize was that actually it was creating, uh, in a, after you go to Zoom, the chats are saved in separate subfolders. I thought it would have just been based on a name. But anyway, that was another subject, sorry. All right, we're, gonna, we're ready to get going again, perfect. So. Let's get, let's get into answering some of, some of Charles's questions a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm going to share with you an exercise. We're going we're to talk through this. Um, let's pretend that we are all attending a conference. Could be a Masonic conference, could be a work conference, could be a hobby conference. And there are, let's say, 100 people at the conference. And we know a couple. We know a couple people out of the hundred. We're gonna be there for a day and have dinner at night and, and then be done. We're gonna have breakfast, listen to some speakers, have a break, have lunch, listen to some speakers and then have dinner, or listen to some speakers and then head back to the hotel. How many people of the hundred people, how many people do you think you would meet 
in that day. And you can, you can stick a number into chat. You can just haul, holler out a number. How many people of the 100 people, you know a couple of them, but how many people will you meet in that day at the conference? Five or six. Probably about five. I'd probably meet at least 30 of them, maybe more. 30, good, good. So I heard five or six, maybe eight or nine. I heard 30, great. Any, anybody else want to tell me how many you might meet? I think I'd be the five or six old. Charles is in for 50. Okay. Excellent. When we talk about meet, are we talking about introductions and a handshake, or are we talking about a deeper connection than that? Perfect, Derek. What what would you like to consider it for a second? Well, if I was at a Masonic conference, I would be walking around, introducing myself, shaking a lot of hands. Yep. Um, if I was at a different type of conference, a little less of that. But I would be lucky if I had half a dozen people who I continued to talk to after the conference. All right. Perfect. Perfect description, Derek, of how you could move around that conference. You could meet 50 people, you can meet most of the people there. In the end, you will have met many people and decided that you know a handful of them are worth continuing some deeper discussion with. So that's a, that's a great call out. That's the road so, I was gonna go down. If I was gonna meet okay. some people, I would, I would get like five or six good people that I would end up getting phone numbers to talk to after, you know, and, and connect afterwards. And Brian, how many people to do to get to that five or six number? How many people would you shake hands with? Uh, maybe maybe about 15, 20, maybe. OK. All right. Good. So so you can you can see that we're all over the board here from people meeting a handful of people to people meeting 50 or so people to talking about, well, does meeting them mean shaking their hands and getting their name? Or does meeting them mean going into a deeper conversation and I'm going to continue to have that relationship with them even after the conference, right? So all of this is talking about how we as individuals, how each of us interacts with people. So now I'm going to, yeah, go ahead, Jane. Uh, I'd, I'd actually try to meet as many as I could, but then the three meals that you've planned is where I would follow up with the ones that interested me the most. Yep. So Ex if it was a business meeting, I think you would be going around collecting business cards to see how many you could possibly get out of a hundred. And then during the meal time is when you would follow up and dig a little deeper into everybody's psyche to see if they're on board with what you're trying to do or not trying to do. Perfect. So I'm going to, using myself as an example, in my, I was director of global planning for a Fortune 500 company. Once a year, they would bring to Winston-Salem the 500 top executives for the company, of which I was included. When I would go to that meeting, I would be lucky to meet five or six people. I just didn't really like meeting people. But I think my company would have been better off if I met many people and then sort of spent time at, at dinners talking to those people that I really needed to talk to, right? But until I had taken my Clifton strengths, I knew I was an introverted person, which means I don't really like meeting strangers. I don't really like being in big groups. I'm pretty good at being in one person at a time or a small group. Once I took my Clifton strengths, I found out that one of my talents is called relator, which means I like working with my friends. I, I don't necessarily like to meet a bunch of people, but I am very good at creating one relationship at a time. Charles, once I realized that, once I realized I was actually good at talking with one person or a table of people at a time, 
I became a person who pulled people together. I started meeting more people and started to accomplish more work for the company. But it took me understanding that it's okay to be introverted. It doesn't mean I'm not good at conversation with small groups of people or one person at a time. And that knowledge changed the way I did my job. So I, I love it. Now, James, may, James sounds like he's a little bit more of a natural at going around the room and meeting people and, and figuring out, hey, these are the people I'm gonna touch base with at, at the meal times. And that is a great talent to have to walk around and meet many, many people. But I don't have that talent. So I wanna, now I'm gonna give us a little bit of language around that. And I think you'll start to see how we can actually, once you have a talent language, it's easy to communicate differences to people or easy to start to leverage the talents you have. These are four talents that are listed in the Clifton Strengths. Relator, woo, woo means winning others over, connectedness, and includer. Three of them in the blue fall into the relationship building category. One of them, woo, in the yellow, falls into the influencing category. One way to describe these four talents would be a relator like myself prefer not meeting strangers. A woo person actually gets energized by meeting strangers. A connectedness person has never met a stranger. They just think that it's a, it's a friend they have yet to meet that we're all connected. And an, in, and an includer, someone with the includer talent, whether you're a stranger or not, they want to include everyone in what's going on. Now, when you look at these descriptions, they sound a little bit like preferences or tendencies, like the first one relator. I prefer not meeting strangers. But now let's change the let's change that description a little bit. So a relator is a person who is good at making deep connections one person at a time. That is a talent of meeting people one at a time and making a very good connection. Wu means a person with the Wu talent is energized by initiating many quick connections. And like James said, he'll get around and initiate many quick connections, but then he's going to go back and focus in and try to develop a little bit deeper relationship with that person. On connectedness, people that have the connectedness talent can see the ways in which all things are connected. To them, None of us are strangers. We're all in interconnected. We just may not know each other yet. And for the includer, the includer is good at making sure everyone is included, whether you're a newcomer or an old timer, whether you fit in or don't fit in. They want you to be part of what's going on. So each of these talents exist within 34 different themes of talent. Now that I've given it, now that I've given a language for us, I'm going to stop the sharing again. So now we have a little bit of language around how people have talent for connecting with other people. And I think when you when you think about this, you think about a lodge meeting when people are coming, who is the person who greets the new person, Who, who's that person that always is making sure that the new person feels welcome, All right? That person has a talent for that. And that person maybe should be set up in a position of greeter. If you had, I don't know what the title would be, George, for greeter for a Masonic Lodge meeting, probably Sergeant of Arms or something, I don't know. But- Greeter sounds pretty good. Greeter sounds all right, all right. 
So when you start to think, now that we have a language, someone may say to me, I think I might have that woo talent, winning others over, because I like meeting 50 people or 100 people out of 100. I like to get around and make those quick connections. It's not that I'm shallow. It's I like making those quick connections. And by doing it, I will get back to the people that I think I can get a little bit of a deeper relationship with. So think about two people. Let's say James and I go to a conference together and we're, we're from the same company. Well, James, I'm not gonna get around and shake a hundred hands, but James is, he's energized by it. It's what he's good at. He talks to somebody and says, oh, you need to meet my coworker, Malcolm. You guys have so much in common. Let me introduce you to Malcolm. So now James and I have created a partnership. I'm going to go talk to that person and probably have a very good, deep conversation with that person. But I might never have met that person out of the hundred without James's help. So all of these talents play a very important role and none more important really than being able to connect with people. Any, any thoughts on, on that, guys? You know, the, the funny thing of it is, is uh, before, I'm, I'm a theater theater person. Uh, I'm a lighting director. Uh, I, I direct. Um, but I, at a young age, I was an introvert. And it took me a long time to figure out how to master um, what I do. Uh, everybody thinks they, in, in college, everybody thought I was a flirt. But the funny thing of it is, is I was touching base with everybody in the room. And so I was able to learn through my theater how to put up a, a facade and project certain attri attributes to, to uh, be able to get people to work on shows that I was interested in. But for the longest time, I, I don't like crowds. I won't go to concerts. I don't like large bodies of people. But yet, given a task such as a meeting uh, such as that, I get all spun up and touch base with everybody in the room. But at the same time, I'm doing my strategic thinking to, to know who I want to sit with at lunch and who I want to sit with at dinner. That's, oh. that's, a great, that's a great example of figuring out, even in an area where you may not have natural talent that people would associate with that activity, you, you have figured out how to lean into some of your talents to compensate for that. Yeah, it's great. All right, good. I'm going to continue. Thank you for, the, thank you for that, James. Yep. All right, let's get right here. All right. So as George was alluding to, I want to continue to give you a little bit more about Clifton Strengths. We talked about the fact that there are four categories or four domains of talent. Strategic thinking, influencing, relationship building, and executing. And we color code them to make it easy. Under, uh, there are 34 different themes or areas of talent within those domains. You can see the, there's like uh, eight of them under strategic thinking, eight under influencing, nine under relationship building, and nine under executing. Each one of these words has a very specific meaning to Clifton Strength. So, for example, under influencing, you see the word command. Command, someone, my brother is a retired lieutenant colonel. He took the, uh, the Clifton Strength Talent Assessment, and command was number 34 for him. In other words, it was his least talented theme. He said, Malcolm, I hate to tell you this, but your assessment process doesn't work good because obviously, as a leader, I have to have command. 
I said, well, let me explain the definition of command. Command means you're very blunt. You are going to raise the issues no matter how uncomfortable it makes other people feel. You don't care. You're gonna bring up the elephant in the room. I asked my brother, I said, is that how you led people? He said, absolutely not. I always educated people about the issues and help them arrive at the same decisions that I was arriving at. I said, right, so you don't have command because command would work a totally different way. You would simply be very comfortable telling people what to do and not explaining it to them. Now, command is very important and it's a very powerful talent when it's used correctly. But when it's not used correctly, someone might think a person with command is a bully. So my brother quickly, after we talked about the definition for each one of these 34 titles, he said, Malcolm, this assessment got me 100% correct. You need to be teaching a lot more of these workshops and explaining what these words mean. So do be careful when you look at these words, they don't mean exactly what you think they might mean. For example, on execution, executing, achiever, well, I think every one of us would want to be an achiever, but what achiever means is a person with this talent gets a tremendous amount of energy and satisfaction from completing tasks. So when I do work, if I complete a task and that task is not on my to-do list, I will actually add it to my to-do list so I can cross it off because I get so much satisfaction from crossing things off my to-do list and it gives me energy to move on to my next task. So someone might look at that and say, oh, so you're just a doer, Malcolm. You don't really think about it, you just do it. I said, well, yeah, one of my talents is to do tasks and we all need to be doers or find people who can do things for us. So this is just a good quick little idea of there's a lot of information with Clifton Strength. So these are my top five. One of the things about Clifton Strengths, we never shy away from sharing our top five. I'm a, I'm a relater number one. I'm a learner number two. I like to learn things. My best way of learning is through reading and studying. I'm an achiever number three. I do a to-do list every day of my life and I love crossing stuff off my list. I think analytically, number four, analytical. So unlike some of you, I don't think about the future and I don't think about options too much. I really just think there's one right answer and I'm going to arrive at that one right answer. And number five, activator. I don't like to sit around and think too long. I don't like paralysis by analysis. I like to get going and we'll figure it out on the way if we didn't get it perfect. So these are my top five talents that I think of as building blocks. When I have to accomplish something, I try to figure out which of these talents will help me the most. And usually it's two or three of them. And I arrange them and use them to accomplish my task. What's interesting is these talents make us very unique. So when you look at my top five, the chance that I would meet another person that has my top five talents in any sequence for them, any, any way that one through five, that chance is one chance in 278,000 people the chance that I would meet another person who has my top five in the same sequence as me, someone who thinks, feels, and acts quite a bit like me is one chance in 33 million. We are each very unique and powerful with the talents that we have. And that's an important thing to understand 
Talents are natural for us. We tend to think, this is how I am. This is not special. Everybody should be like this. But it's simply not true. People aren't like us. People are powerful in other ways. And that's why we want to work in partnership or on teams together. Vince Lombardi probably put it best. The achievements of an organization are the results of the combined effort of each individual. People who work together will win. Individual commitment to the group effort, that is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, a civilization work. So bringing everybody together and getting them energized, getting them engaged, getting them using their talents, that's what's gonna help our organization, the Masons, win. So we're gonna, we're gonna stop and we're gonna have a little exercise here. We're gonna take about uh, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And I'm gonna let the group have a good group discussion. So I'm gonna stop the share. We're gonna see each other's faces. Oh, right. I'm going to turn the discussion completely over to the group. I'm going to let you guys have a self discussion. And I want you to think about, I want you to discuss what you think the one or two, maybe the two biggest issues facing Masons right now. And as you discuss that, hopefully you can come up with maybe one action that you could take to address that challenge. So what are the one or two biggest challenges facing Freemasonry right now? And if you can get a list of one or two couple, maybe you can even add an action item to it. So I'm gonna let you guys take over the conversation and uh, see what we come up with. Well, I guess the obvious one right now is membership. That seems to be the biggest one. Um, purpose. I think that's the biggest problem. Um, that's a good one. Masons, you know, pretty much everyone I've talked to, it's, it's really a social club in everyone's mind. And once you get to become an officer, you know, past, like past master and on, it becomes a numbers game to you. You know, everyone else is mice in a cogwheel, basically. The idea of building pillars to the community or even pillars to oneself, you know, is not an issue. How many lodges do you know even take time to do stuff like this, for example? You know, where you're actually talking about ways to help people improve themselves. I think I think one I of think the active member, problems, active membership. I think one of the biggest problems that Masons have is this this failure to recruit. Um, this whole thing of if you want to become a Mason, ask one or go knock on the door. We don't have a way of going out into the other than doing our good deeds in, in society. We have no way of getting out there and recruiting a younger version of us. Um, if we wait for them to come to us, then we've lost. True. We need to actively go out there and seek our replacements. True. To, to continue this, the craft to continue on. It's just the way it is. I mean, it, 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 it goes from family member to family member. I mean, look how many we, McDougals we've got on the screen. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. That's one thing we we can recruit within <laughs> our families, but it's not our families that's going to support Masons. It's everybody. Uh, you know? That's a great point. And actually, you two are talking about very similar things. Because what's going to get those people in there? You know, we don't want them to come in here for a club type of atmosphere. So we need Charles to tell them, hey, what's the purpose here? course that gets very tricky because 
my purpose and your purpose probably might be different things, you know? So mm -hmm. that's great and, discussion. Brother Charles brings up a good I, point. I, and, and I'll say too, when it, the education side of masonry seems to be okay. Um, when we do lectures like this and other lectures I've been to, there will be a number of brothers, non-brothers, whatever, coming to these meetings. They'll get 30, 40, you know, a lecture. So it seems like the education part is there. So my problem is, is there a, is there a miscommunication? Is there an issue between, you know, getting brothers into lodges in person versus, you know, going to educational meetings? Are we just not promoting masonry correctly, you think? I think maybe one of the issues is to, to really let people know why, you know, sort of why, why should I become a Mason? What is it that I will, that I will get out of being a Mason that I don't get from, from anything else, both individually and really as a society? Because um, I think that, that a, lot of, a lot of us come to these because we know why. We have an understanding of, of why we come to these, you know, to learn, to develop ourselves, to really gain that knowledge that, that we want. But I think once people know why, a lot of times they'll, they'll get that. Um, you know, it's like we, we might have different, um, you know, different reasons why we get into masonry initially, but it's always like different paths to the top of a mountain. Everyone wants to get to the top of the mountain. It's just a matter of once we know that that's, that's the goal, then yeah, we'll have a lot of different ways of, of reaching that. But it's always that one that one thing that that draws us together. Can I inject something again? So I have to qualify. Oh, go ahead. You're first. You started earlier. Uh, I, I was just going to say there's two things that I've tried to do personally since I've become a Mason, and and, and I'm not. I'm an old guy that I came in, you know, I'm 67 years old. I came in a few years back. So I haven't had a lifetime of Masonic experience. And I hear guys say, well, I'm a 32nd this and I'm a 31 degree that. <clears throat> and that is not my intent to, as being a Mason to fulfill what I need. But I also make it a point to let people know in my community that I am a Mason. I'm not afraid to speak it. I, in the past, I think a lot of secrecy is involved with Mason, masonry. And I, as a performer, I get up and I play music and I get in front of crowds and stuff. I let people know I'm a Mason. And, and when p young guys come up to me and ask me, say, well, why are you a Mason? What do you get out of it? I said, I said, you're on the internet. That's a great way of networking, right? And they say, yep. I said, this is the real way of networking in your community, being with businessmen and people with life experience to, to shake hands with and sit down and have a cup of coffee with and really network one-on-one -on -one with, with people, like-minded people. And these are two things that I do personally since I've become Mason. I noticed that speaking to a lot of guys in the lodge that uh, unless it has to do with a, a school program or books or bikes for kids or something, uh, there really isn't much interaction in the community. And, and I don't know why that is. I, um, I've had people come up to me and say, well, isn't it a secret organization, this and that? You know, ritualistically speaking, Yes, it is. And that's personal for us. But what we are trying to do in the community is to make a better community for our fellow members where we live. And I just think that that's kind of that kind of gets lost in translation, I think. And and I try to talk about that amongst my brothers at the lodge. Is any some of you people from far away? the state of Maine is celebrating its history with, with Masons and they put out a, 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 a I don't know what, what you call it. It's a little clipette. A flyer. A movie oh. about Masons and it, and it incorporates Masons from all the different parts of our state. It shows mission statements for our different branches of Masons 
And I think that that was the one thing coming from a, from a performer's point of view, that this was the one thing that we could broadcast to non-members and, and try to use it as a recruitment tool. I watched it over and over again. It's a very good piece put together. It's what is 150 years of Masons in Maine. Or is it? I believe that's it. 150. Yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a good movie, all about Masons. You know, the different parts. Um, I'm I'm a not only am I a master Mason, but I I went into your Scottish Rite because of my personal religious background. I couldn't do the other side. What I find with the Scottish Rite is a failure. You don't get all the, the teachings. They don't come around all the time. It's not like the York Rite where you go through a ladder and, and build up progressively. In Scottish Rite, they, they make you a 30-second up front, and then you've got to build up, up all the other ones. So I put out a, a thing to the York Rite, what's that? There you go. That's a good question. I, I was being facetious. You're being facetious. I've been trying to follow. <laughs> there you go. I've been, I've been trying to follow the York right in my district. And two years I've been waiting for somebody to show me the way through the York right. It doesn't exist in my district. It, it yeah. disappeared. And, I joined, and it's a shame. I joined York right it's about a, shame a year ago. It has. And uh, yeah, it's hard to follow. It's hard to find out when they're doing meetings or anything like that. So the yeah, it's not really out there. I have to ask this: these two comments. Is this like in the past? You know, while Corona has been in session. Because first of all, I, to just so you guys understand, I've been out of the game since '94. That's when I left the U.S. And the only time I've communicated Masonically has been on the internet and different groups for a period until I ruffled a few feathers and someone from another organization altogether reminded me of what can happen if I step on the wrong toes. So I stepped out of that and then I just started again. So I have to be honest. I don't really know everything that's going on now. But some of the things that I did hear, a lot of it relates to what you guys are saying. But one thing that you're not saying is that there actually is recruitment going on in masonry. I mean, I've had brothers tell me that they, you know, when they find somebody that they want, but these are usually lawyers, you know, executives and companies, they recruit them for their lodge. You know, it becomes like a business decision. Like if, if you're, a, you know, a rising lawyer, you're going to get recruited. If you're a rising doctor, you're going to get recruited. Mm. You know, and I've heard this recently. Now, I know historically we used to have to do our parades. That's how we got known in the community. And you had to go to a Shriners hospital. Then you'd see the men running around laughing and acting silly a little bit at the same time, taking that work seriously. Yep. So, all right. So perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to bring the discussion to a close. So as you think about the discussion you were just having, I, I, I was taking some notes. I heard some really good comments around membership and purpose recruiting was was anybody else taking notes? If you if you were taking notes, put your hand up. Okay. So we didn't have a note. We didn't have anybody who naturally takes notes or takes charge of the meeting. So that that potential talent group was missing. If we had Luke on with us, what's Luke's last name, George? Shorty. <laughs> Shorty. Yeah, Shorty, there we go. Thank you. Shorty, Luke Shorty. All right. But Luke, Luke would have been making sure everybody was talking right. He would be taking notes and stuff. 
So as you go through that, you guys were talking about some very meaningful stuff. You were doing some great strategic thinking. As we go through that, it's always good to have people on the team who are making sure everybody's jumping in, everybody's being heard, everyone has a chance, someone's taking notes. So as you think about the talent, for me, I wanted to see how you guys would handle the discussion more than just simply understand the topics you would come up with. So keep those type of things in mind as you think about talent. Someone who helps manage a meeting, someone who doesn't necessarily bring up the best ideas, but is very good at making sure everybody is heard, that person's bringing tremendous value to the process. So great, good. Let me, let's go to the finish here. And uh, George, I probably stole your thinking man statue, by the way, you and Don's. I stole it from my work, so. <laughs> All right, so um, the, the last, the last truth that I want to tell you about talent is this, that differences are advantages. All of, all of us have different talents. There's only one chance in 278,000 that someone has the same top five as me. One chance in 33 million that it's identically list sequence to me, right? We're all different. We all are bringing different values into the, into the organization. So let's, we just need to keep that in mind. So we've, we've, uh, I've got a little riddle here. And hopefully by now, you guys all know the answer to this riddle. Though possessed by all, not everyone is aware of. I am shrouded in myth and misconception from cradle to cubicle. And even to coffin, I often go unrecognized and unused. What am I? I'm talent. So as we think about that, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to go past the questions for a second. We'll come back. I want to talk about an opportunity that George mentioned during the intermission, during our break. And I'm gonna use a Chinese proverb. When is the best time to plant a shade tree? The answer is 20 years ago. When's the next best time? The answer is today. So let's talk about what you could do if you're interested in learning more about your talents and the talents of the people around you and how to use those talents more. You have the option of taking the Clifton Strengths Assessment by using one of these six books. These books all come with a free assessment, one-time use coupon in the back. The basic book is on the upper left, Strength Finders 2.0. That book has a tremendous amount of information about the 34 different themes of talent. The other books are a little more specialized. If you're in the field of sales or want to learn more about selling, you can use strength-based selling as your book. If you're in a leadership role or want to know more about leadership, you can use strength-based leadership as your book and a free coupon. There's, a there's also a student version. Um, it's the, and again, it's the same assessment, just a different book, a different frame of reference. So there is a, a book for high school students and college students, if you have, people like that in your life and you want them to take the Clifton Strength Assessment, they can get their coupon from the back of that book. There is a teacher one, Teach With Your Strengths. And then there is a parenting one, Strength-Based Parenting. This last book comes with an adult assessment and a special assessment, which is a different assessment for children who have not reached high school age yet the language of that assessment is more appropriate for younger, younger students. So if you purchase one of these books from your favorite place to purchase books, do not purchase a used copy because the coupon is a one-time use only coupon. You need to purchase a new copy um, and then you can take the assessment on the internet 
after you complete the assessment, you will receive, you can go and drop down a five page PDF report on your top five strengths. You'll need to go back to the website and download that, re that personalized report. The personalized report is incredibly accurate. The book is more generic and gives you more information about all 34 talent, themes of talent. Your report will give you your top five. Because Gallup is a company, a for-profit company, they will try to upsell you so that you get a report that shows you your full 34 talent report. I can highly recommend paying the $39 to upgrade your report to the full 34. When you do that, you'll need to go back to the website and you'll be able to download a 25 page report that talks about your, all of your talents, primarily your top 10 talents, but shows you the ranking of all 34 talents for you. I, and again, I, I always recommend that for my, for my clients. To be clear, I don't make any money off of you going and purchasing that book or doing the upgrade or any of that. That's between you and Gallup Corporation. Um, but this taking this assessment is a prerequisite for our Talent 201 class that George mentioned will be occurring in January for the first time. In that class, you will have taken your assessment. You will have sent me by email your top five results. I will return to you or your top 10 if you upgrade, you can send me your top 10 results. I will send you personalized information from a computer system that I have that Gallup does not use, but has licensed. And I will then take you through a personalized two hour class where each of you will be able to talk about your talents and how they show up in you and we will create, help you create a personal brand using your talents, using your values, and focusing on Stephen M. R. Covey's The Speed of Trust book. We will help you develop how you show up every day. So I'll, I'll make that plug for the Maine Masonic College for the class in January. Um, we, we will be publicizing that class and creating the way that you can get my email to send me your results prior to the class so that I can return to you some personalized information which you will draw heavily upon during that class. So I hope, I hope that you've enjoyed the class and I'd just like to open it up for any questions or questions or comments that you have. Well, I'll just say that uh, I found this very interesting and I can't wait to uh, take that test. Great, thank you, Derek. Malcolm, the Covey book was The Speed of Trust. The, uh, yeah, MR, Stephen M. R. Covey, the son of Stephen Covey wrote the book, The Speed of Trust. It is an excellent, I rank it as one of the top five books I've ever read. Um, talking about the topic of trust. It is tremendous. I'm currently using it in my consulting practice to when I have to, when, I'm a, when I've been asked to work with people who are in conflict with each other, I'm using the speed of trust material to help people work through conflict. Thanks, and the other four of your top five are your dad's books, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, gotta put, I probably should put at least one in there. You know, that uh, Angel of Baton would be, I think, one of, probably one of his best, best books. Thanks for doing this. Thank, thanks for joining. Yeah. Definitely, thank you. Charles, I hope you have a 
uh, interest uh, in a way to get a hold of one of those Gallup books so that you can. No, I'm going to try my best. The issue is just, you know, for me, it's now it's always money. I yeah. haven't really worked since I left the U.S. Gotcha. So every penny I spend is like, hmm, how many meals am I going to have to cut out now? <laughs> there you go. You know, well, but good. I'm going to see if what I can find. You know, you've yeah. given me an idea, the general area that I need to work in. Yep. I have nothing but time on my hand. Perfect. You know, so it's just the question of pushing the ball back uphill. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's really thinking that when you think about those four categories, yep. those four domains, it really, really boils down to how do we think about a problem? How do we gather information? How do we create a solution? Then how do we recruit other people? How do we work with other people? And finally, what are our best ways of executing? For me, the achiever allows me to create a to-do list. And if I don't have a to-do list, I'm not going to get a lot done for me. So that's Actually, just I one think point. I have the same problem because I used yeah. to do that a lot. And then... I stopped because someone told me that I'm I'm getting so it was like I was making to do lists and they were saying that I've turned that into a job. <laughs> well, if you need it, you need it. The the key is having the to do list is getting through it, right? And yeah. figure out what talents you have that help you get through the to do list. Yeah. Yep. And that was that you know I was, but at the same time, not sure. How can I put it? You know, I just let things fall apart is the best way to put it. Okay. <laughs> but you reminded me that used to work for me. Yep, exactly. All right. Yeah, this for me, realizing that I was an achiever, once I realized well, what that meant from the assessment, um, I had always done to do lists, especially in my personal life. But I struggled to do to-do lists at work. Well, why? Because the projects I was working on were large projects, and they took more than one day to accomplish. And I realized I wasn't getting energized by completing tasks. So I had to break my I had to break my large tasks into small steps. And once I did that. I had something to check off my list every hour or two. Um, so it really changed, just becoming familiar with why the achiever, why the to-do list worked for me, reinforced that I needed to do it. So I figured out how to break the items up into smaller steps. And then I became much more effective. Mm. Uh, Malcolm, is, is talents almost like, like a workout almost where you have to continue um, you know, at your talent, because um, I'll use it, you know, like an example, you know, if you exercise for a long time, and then you stop doing it, you kind of get lazy almost. And when you try to get back to it, it's harder than it was before. Is that kind of what your talent is as well? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. You'll see that I think in the Strength Finders 2.0 book, they talk about that. Your talents are like muscles. If you don't use them, you will lose them. So you really need to be constantly aware of your talent. You, that's why we want people to be aware of them. And then we want to start to put them into action. So as I work with clients, the first thing we do after, we, after they know what their talents are, we start to build out that personal brand statement for that person. We actually make them start to think about how they use their talents every day or how they could use them more as they build out that statement of how they show up every day. This is what, this is what you can expect from me. This is how I will show up every day. Personal brand is a sort of a fancy name for those two things. So, do, you think do you think there's a wall with like instant, like instant maybe gratification or instant results like if you're not getting results why right away people will get frustrated and not you know and just give up i i assume that like myself most people need to see some results pretty quickly 
so that right. they can start to really get energized about continuing down that journey. Yep. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll raise my hand to that. I'm guilty of that too. You know, if I, if I'm trying to do something and I'm not getting results right away, I'll be like, well, I'm not doing that anymore. That's, it's not bringing fruit. You know what I mean? So my, so when I use this with corporate clients, we start out with Clifton strengths in the first workshop and people love it. They're super energized. They say, this is me. And the next work, we immediately follow it up with a workshop within two weeks of now we're going to talk about what you do for work every single day. What are the tasks you do every day? Because we're going to try to start to tie the two things immediately together. Um, and simply being aware of your talent, that's not the purpose of Clifton Strength. We want you to be able to leverage your talents, to use them to actually create greater and greater outcomes for yourself, whether they're professional or personal outcomes. And I think, you know, when you think about an organization like the Masons, we want our members showing up using their talents, because if they use their talents, let's go back to the why we want talent to be focused on. People have more energy, people have more confidence, people get more done, right? So people are, are going to be more engaged. They're six times more engaged in what they're doing. So we want people to lean into their talents. And once people start doing it, people love it. People, people will tell you, yeah, I have a lot more energy coming to work now than I had before because I'm using my talents. Um, and and I think we all probably, yeah, yeah I'm I sure think, the confidence think, in the roof. One thing that um, was hitting me while we were doing this talk was I began to wonder how much of what you're talking about is something due to upbringing because I started thinking about what could possibly be my talents. And then immediately I started seeing links to, you know, to these behaviors being shaped by my childhood and, and young adulthood and stuff like that. Yep. As opposed to something that I could have naturally been born with. There is definitely a combination of nature, what you're born with, and nurture, okay. how you're raised. Okay, so uh, then it is that too. Yeah, it's just once, once you reach high school and beyond, it becomes very difficult to recreate those pathways in your mind to create new talent. Okay. But, if, but if, you, if you did have a um, traumatic experience, and I'll use, this isn't, I don't want to say traumatic, but let's say that you joined the military after college. You might gain a talent like focus or discipline or harmony that you hadn't had as high in your list before because of that significant experience of military service yeah no so, i understand you because then they very intense level of conditioning correct you'd have to have a very intense level of conditioning to make a change later in life yeah great great way to put it so if you to to take this next 2.0 you have to buy one of those books and go through the correct test. Yep, the, the book is the books are usually about twenty dollars on Amazon. Um, you'll get the free coupon in the back of the new book. Take the assessment online. The assessment takes about thirty five minutes. Although I always recommend clearing your calendar for about one hour of calm, quiet time. After you take the assessment, you can go back out to the Gallup website and drop down your PDF file, which gives you a five page report. Um, and uh, then from there, that will prepare you for the class. I'll work, I will work with the college. We'll set up a registration process for that class so that we know everybody is prepared ahead of time and has been able to communicate via email with me to share their results and for me to share other information with them about their, their talents to be used in that class. And I also will send out for that class, I will send to each participant 
four or five pages of material of which you might want to print out two or three pages to use during the class to write on as you prepare that personal brand statement. Thanks for having this for us, Malcolm. <laughs>